I'm Nirvida here. I'm from the Mallinckrodt Institute of Radiology, which is a part of the Washington University in St. Louis. We do a lot of musculoskeletal work, and today's lecture is going to be about the overview of musculoskeletal ultrasound. Today we are going to talk about an overview of the musculoskeletal ultrasound. As musculoskeletal ultrasound has gained more acceptance in the community, I think it's important to understand what are the main areas we can focus on when we attempt to do a musculoskeletal ultrasound. Generally, you can pretty much look at everything, but the focus usually is on muscles, tendons, joints, ligaments, nerves, soft tissues, and bone. We'll go through the basic techniques, the equipment, image optimization, a recognition of artifacts that is important in musculoskeletal ultrasound, the normal sonographic appearances, and then some abnormal appearances. The musculoskeletal ultrasound is always targeted and interactive. You have to ask the patient the questions. How long are the symptoms? Was the onset of symptoms sudden or insidious? Was there any causative event? Are there any aggravating factors? Is it age-related change? Is it related to remote trauma? And always compare with the other side. We use linear arrays which are of high frequency, so good resolution, although the depth may be compromised. We have to make sure we have good elevation plane focus, use a wide dynamic range, and decrease the power. Multiple vendors have multiple post-processing tools that can also help in making the image better. Here is a transducer that shows the elevation plane and the long axis. This illustration shows how if you have a narrow elevation plane focus, you can see a lesion much clearly. If that red dot represents a cyst in the soft tissue, the part of the image on the left side shows that the beam thickness goes through that entire cyst and so will form a clear image. The illustration on the right shows that the beam is much thicker than the red dot, which means that even though the red dot may be a cyst, there is going to be a significant partial volume averaging and there will not be an anechoic cyst seen on the ultrasonographic image. This is partial volume averaging. One way to get over it, if you do not have dedicated musculoskeletal ultrasound transducers, is to increase the depth or the distance the sound travels before it reaches its focal point. You could use a gel pad for that. Once you have a gel pad of an appropriate thickness, then you are attempting to visualize the lesion at the point of minimum or maximum narrowing or maximum focus. Here are two examples of linear transducers. The second transducer with the gel pad is a 3D transducer. Now the scan techniques involves, apart from the standoff pads, the heel and toe maneuver. This is where you rock the transducer back and forth, making sure that you are imaging the tendons and the muscles in an orthogonal plane. Make sure two orthogonal planes are visualized and comparisons are done on split screens. This is a dynamic examination, so examining the patient while doing the movements is extremely important. Record the exam on cine loops for reviewing later on. Here is an illustration showing the hull and the toe effect of the transducer. The transducers on the top are rocking back and forth, and you can see here how you tilt them forward or tilt them backward such that they can be perpendicular to the tendon. This is the view of the transducer from the side, which means a transverse view. Even when you do a transverse examination, this rocking motion is important to get rid of an isotropy. Apart from an optimum dynamic range, make sure you use a gray map that does not oversaturate the image. 
use time gain compensation to avoid overgain and use high contrast. We have talked about the varying angle of insonation which leads to the artifact of anisotropy. This is also important for the same reason it is also important that tendons are best seen when they are stretched. A stretched tendon is going to show its normal echo pattern and will be hyperechoic. Here is the illustration showing the artifact of anisotropy. When the source sends a sound beam that gets reflected completely back by a structure that runs at 90 degrees to the insonation angle, then you get a very good reflection. However, if that structure or that tendon is going at an angle, then you lose a large part of your sound beam as it comes back as an echo. This leads to us seeing that tendon as a dark structure. This reflector appears dark and this is the principle of anisotropy. Muscle fibers are arranged in bundles called fascicles and each fascicle is surrounded by a stronger connective tissue layer termed perimysium. Each muscle consists of multiple fasciculi. On ultrasound, the muscle has this normal appearance. This is a pennate pattern of multiple hypoechoic lines converging to the central pennate. This is a zoomed up view of the muscle. Again, a normal view of the muscle with multiple fascial planes separating the muscle bundles. This is an extended field of view showing the entire length of the muscle. The most common injuries you would see are muscular. A grade 1 injury is a mild injury in which on ultrasound you may not see any appreciable distortion of fibers. A grade 2 is a partial tear. A grade 3 is a complete tear of the tendon. On the left side is the normal echo pattern of the muscle. On the right side, you can see that the normal echo pattern of the muscle is destroyed because there is some infiltrative hemorrhage within the myofibrils. Here again, the left side of the image shows grade 1 injury. The right side of the image shows normal muscle. This is a transverse view of the quadriceps muscle showing an internal area of altered echo pattern. The rest of the muscle is intact around that area. This is how a partial tear is seen. A complete rupture of the muscle leads to retraction of the muscle and the muscle itself appears bunched up or bulky. Here is a retracted quadriceps muscle after a rupture. The other part of muscular injuries deals with muscular hematomas. This is a demonstration of the intramuscular hematoma. You can see this is a lobulated hypoechoic lesion within the muscular planes. On color Doppler, there is no increase in vascularity or no vascularity within the lesion. This is consistent with a hematoma given the background of history of injury. You have to remember while investigating the muscles, multiple incidental tumors or pseudotumors can also be visualized. Going in depth for each one of them is beyond the scope of this talk. But as a part of the overview, it is important to differentiate between lesions that are solid and lesions that are cystic. Here is a lesion which shows, which is seen to be hypoechoic and well defined and seems to show a little bit of through transmission initially concerning for a hematoma. On color Doppler examination, there was internal vascularity noted within this lesion consistent with a solid tumor. This is the image of a muscle herniation from a fascial defect. This is a pseudotumor. Tendons. Tendons usually attach to tuberosities, spinae, trochanters, processes and ridges. Most of the time, ultrasound evaluation of a tendon is either to look at a tear or a degenerative change. On ultrasound, the description of a tendon, a normal tendon echo pattern is known as a fibrillar echo pattern. 
These are fine echogenic lines which correspond to interfaces between the collagen and the endotenon. On a transverse section, a fine punctate pattern is noted. Tendons are mobile and the synovial sheath might appear as hypoechoic area around the tendon. On ultrasound, as you can see on these two images, the tendon shows a normal fibrillar pattern. On the image at the top, the focal zone is relatively lower. After putting a pad of gel above anterior to the skin, you can see that the tendon is much better visualized with a good fibrillar pattern and the focal zone is appropriately located. This is a view of the biceps tendon in the bicipital groove. You can see a good fibrillar pattern as the beam is coming at 90 degrees to the axis of the tendon. If the tendon is not insonated at 90 degrees, then you see a tendon that is much darker and this phenomena is known as anisotropy as we have discussed previously. Here is a demonstration on the transverse plane of the phenomena of anisotropy. You have the Achilles tendon seen on two images. The one on the left is a hyperechoic tendon, the one on the right, the one on the left is a hyperechoic tendon, the one on the right is a hypoechoic tendon. The one on the left is when the sound is 90 degrees to the tendon. The one on the right is when the transducer and transverse plane had an abnormal angle and thus there was an isotropy. When you deal with tendons, it is important to understand that the inflammation of the sheath around the tendon can lead to tenosynovitis. Hypoechoic area around the tendon itself represents the synovial sheath. There is one important aspect to a musculoskeletal interpretation of tenosynovitis and that is the understanding of the myotendinous junction or the musculotendinous junction. If that is a musculotendinous junction, then on ultrasound you can see that central tendon enveloped by the muscle fibers as they decrease in thickness and towards the insertion only the tendon remains. If an ultrasound beam does a transverse section short of the myotendinous junction, then you can get an appearance like this in which there is a hypoechoic area around the tendon. This simulates a sheath, however these are normal muscle fibers and not a thickened synovial sheath. A synovial sheath is seen much later down, further down close to the insertion of the tendon itself. Here is an example of posterior tibial tenosynovitis. The tendon appears hyperechoic and fibrillar. On color doppler there is intense increase in vascularity within the sheath surrounding the tendon. The other aspect of tendons is tears. Here is an example of a tendo Achilles tear. This is the normal tendo Achilles on the other side. This is an MRI and a 3D coronal reconstruction of the same tear of the tendon. Ultrasound can also look at nerves. Here is an example of a normal median nerve in the wrist joint. This is a transverse view of the, medi of the median nerve and you can see it has small hypoechoic and punctate areas interspersed. The nerves are less amenable to an isotropy. Sometimes that can help them to be differentiated well from the tendons. Here is an example of a nerve in long section and a tendon together at the wrist joint. This is the ulnar nerve seen close to the elbow. Ulnar neuropathy can lead to thickening of the ulnar nerve. Here you can see this is a relatively thick segment of the ulnar nerve. In such cases an extended field of view can show a greater length of the nerve. Here you can see this is a normal caliber ulnar nerve becomes thicker as it crosses the elbow and then tries to regain its normal caliber. This is an example of a peroneal nerve neuroma. 
This patient came with classic symptoms and we focused our search for a Morton's neuroma. You can see a small nerve ending exiting from this neuroma. An entering nerve was difficult to visualize. Ultrasound can also look at ligaments. A ligament almost looks like a tendon with a normal hyperechoic appearance with a fibrillar texture pattern. Here is an example showing the rupture of a collateral ligament at the knee joint with a hematoma. Here is a thick plantar fascia at its insertion. You can see it's hypoechoic and thickened compared to the normal on the opposite side. This is a case of plantar fasciitis. Although MRI is the choice for diagnosing meniscal tears, in some rare cases, if the patient cannot have an MRI, ultrasound can look at the meniscus at the peripheral part of the knee joint. Here you can see this hyperechoic triangular area is the meniscus. There is one case which showed a meniscal tear on ultrasound. Ultrasound is also being more and more used in evaluation of rheumatoid arthritis. This is a good slide from radiographics to look at the concept of subchondral erosion because of the inflammation of the synovium. If you look at a zoomed up image of the portion, you see that small area where the synovium, the blue plaque like area is the synovium, inserts onto the subchondral portion of the bone. Ultrasound is very sensitive at picking up these subchondral erosions. Synovial hypertrophy seen here at the joint space represents a case of rheumatoid arthritis. Here is another case which shows subchondral erosion. After we've looked at the tendons and ligaments, we will look at the bursae. Bursae are virtual spaces which allow for fluid movement of the tendons. Sometimes, if there is fluid collection within the bursal space, a patient can be symptomatic and an inflammation of that area can lead to bursitis. Bursitis can be secondary to trauma, hemorrhage, infection, and it also may be seen in inflammatory arthropathy or dialysis-related amyloid arthropathy. This is a small amount of fluid seen in the subdeltoid bursal space. Here is an example of a patient with frozen shoulder. You can see that this is the tendon. On the top is a subdeltoid bursa which appears to be thick. Here's a case of infrapatellar bursitis. This is the patella, this is the infrapatellar ligament at its insertion on the tibia and there is an inflamed bursa with fluid. Ultrasound is very good at looking at cystic lesions near joints. A few examples would include looking at a ganglion cyst, a baker cyst and a paraarticular cyst. Here's an example of a ganglion cyst at the scapholuminate joint. This is a large cyst which was more on the radial aspect, however had a neck that was leading towards the scapholuminate ligament. This is a complex multi-septated ganglion cyst. Here is an example of a Baker cyst in the popliteal fossa. Ultrasound is very good for looking at foreign bodies in the soft tissues, especially related to penetrating injuries. If you have a radio-opaque foreign body, which might even be seen on a plain film, a radiolucent foreign body is more likely to be seen well on ultrasound. Glass, metal, or stone would be seen as hyperechoic structures with or without shadowing but wood would be seen as a hyperechoic structure with shadowing. In terms of glass and metal, apart from shadowing, you might even see a comet tail artifact. 
This is a picture of foreign body demonstrating small specks of glass within the soft tissue. Two of these specks are very close to the tendon. Here are two pictures showing the appearance of a foreign body that is made of wood. These are essentially thorns or splinters within the soft tissue. One of them seems to be showing a good shadow. Here is one example of a splinter in the soft tissue with surrounding vascularity implying there is some inflammation around this joint, around this uh, foreign body. In conclusion, musculoskeletal ultrasound has got a very wide spectrum. You are pretty much limited by your learning curve. It takes some time to get a hang of the normal appearances of the tendons, the ligaments and the other structures. However, if you practice on normal volunteers, that can decrease the learning curve. A targeted interactive approach is important. In equipment specific to MSK imaging which might include specialized transducers like the hockey stick probe might have to be used. Always remember that this is a dynamic examination. So try and simulate the movements which might be increasing the symptoms of the patient and do not forget to do comparisons with the normal side.